you very much for coming today to our Facebook live panel, Journey Tour to Cure. Um, all of you in this room, we're going to have a good time. Facebookers at home, we're going to have a good time. Um, this is going to be inspirational and a learning experience, and it's all about community. So this is a really cool time. Um, my name is Sam Talbot. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a chef. I'm also a co-founder of Beyond Type 1. And Beyond Type 1 is um, it's an organization that we really we like to celebrate the diabetic the diabetes community, both type 1 and type 2. Um, we have three pillars that we really try to uh, live by. It's, our, it's like our motto statement, if you will. You know, um, we try to push the levels of advocacy all the time. We, through different programs, through just raising awareness. We also, um, we're also funding and fighting for a cure. So that's a big thing of, you know, we're trying to um, demolish this chronic illness as, as quickly as possible. And also education. We're just raising the levels of education between the differences of type one, the folklore that comes, type one and type two, the folklore uh, that comes with both of those um, chronic Ill illnesses. And that's really what Beyond Type One is about. So enough about me. Um, in my foundation, but we're honored to be here today with City of Hope, which has one of the, more, the world's most influential diabetes research programs, and that's just a magnificent feat, right? We're not talking in the United States, but we're talking global, globally. Um, for me, that means a lot. I was diagnosed at age 12. Now, you guys can't tell this, but I'm 41 right now. Um, <laughs> so from when I was diagnosed at age 12, it was quite some time ago, and it was a different diagnosis, I think, from when you get diagnosis, diagnosed today. Um, the technology, the groups, the support, the, adva the advancements, they just weren't there. It was 20 some odd years ago. God, I hate saying that. Um, but it, it was just a different time. So today, this is, this is more of a, um, it's just, it's, it, if you're gonna be diagnosed with type one or type two, now's the time, because it's, there's, the technology is, is, is wrapping itself closely. Um, I think we're close to a cure and we're close to, um, so, to more hope on a daily basis, which is what we're here for, right? So I'm thrilled to moderate this all-star cast of um, researchers and advocates in the type 1D, T1D world. And um, what's really cool is we're also happy to have um, the T1D Mod Squad here with us, the founders Rebecca Hada and Anna Reinhardt. Um, these moms of kids with type 1 and some of the most dedicated diabetes advocates you'll ever meet. Um, we, you know, I guarantee that. <laughs> um, so with that being said, first I'd like to welcome Ava Hada, who is a junior advocate for the T1D Mod Squad. She's going to come up right here, sit next to me, and um, she's going to tell us her story on what it's like living with type 1. Welcome to the stage. There you are. So hi, everybody. My name's Ava Hada with the T1D Mod Squad. Um, I've had type 1 diabetes for about 93% of my life. So in real time, that means 13 and a half years. Um, that's a long time. And like Sam said, a long time ago, I mean, 13 years wasn't that too long ago. But when I first got my pump, it was some of the newest technology out. And now that we have technology that's the size of a dime um, that saves my life every day, that's pretty incredible. So like many of the kids in here and watching, I have hobbies and passions that I pursue every day. Um, I ride horses, I train dogs, and I play the trumpet. So whenever I have time, which is not a lot. <laughs> um, so for 13 and a half years, I've been meeting people through my journey um, with the service dogs. I have diabetic alert dogs. And um, I've been able to help other kids kind of navigate their way through type 1 diabetes because it is so complex. And um, it's not the same for every person. So when we tell one kid something, it's going to be completely different for the next kid. They're going to experience something that nobody else is going to experience. And that's hard. That's what makes this disease difficult to be with all the time. Um, I know my disease intimately through my time with it, and my family has been instrumental to my <laughs> success as a healthy diabetic. Um, I've been watching them, and I've realized parenting is very hard. Um, there's no instruction manual, and there's no instruction manual for diabetes, so it just makes it that much more complicated. Um, my endocrinologist has been a wonderful support to me, um, and my family too, but the way I 
maintain an A1C isn't only because of the people that are around me, it's also because of the animals that are around me. My dogs are pretty amazing. They can alert up to 20 and 30 minutes before my CGM or my pump starts alarming, and I'm able to make small corrections that keep me in range and able to live a healthy life. Um, sometimes when I don't want to drink another juice for my mom, I will do it for my dog because when a dog comes up to you and gives you juice, how can you say no? Um, so it's absolutely worth that extra stress, time, and money for some people. Um, this allows me to do a lot of things that I potentially couldn't do as a diabetic, like when I'm riding my horses, my dog can allow me the freedom by alerting to my mom when I start dropping. So I can continue to ride instead <coughs> of stopping um, the whole entire thing and having to treat. So it's my personal belief that everybody in this room here today is here for something greater than just for type 1 diabetes. Um, and I can't thank everybody enough for the opportunity to let me speak about my passion and my personal experience as a diabetic. Um, it's always not this fabulous, you know, having all these great people here. Um, diabetes isn't always the face that's portrayed from the media. Um, it's those late night scares and the juices and everything that's really scary about type 1 diabetes is real for us. Um, I'm showing you my juice, Ava. Yeah. <laughs> it's always there. Um, and I'm really just proud and honored to be here today to talk to you guys. And I want to thank the Wanak family for generously funding all of this research um, and Dr. Rope in the City of Hope for just bringing what a cure could do in real terms to our family and how it could change our life. So thank you very much. I mean, they call you a junior advocate, but she's much more of a junior. She's like advocate, advocate, like rock star, rock star, next level, next level. I don't even know what just happened. Um, so there's that. There's, you know, it's just, and you normally, you don't get that type of face when you're when, with diabetes, right, with that type of story. Um, and so well-spoken and eloquent. Um, so I'm going to so share some bullet points with you. Um, discovering insulin's role in processing sugar. Identifying a marker for glucose control in blood. Pioneering the field of islet cell transporta um, <laughs> transportation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, transplantation. And of course, creating the technology that gave the world syn synthetic human insulin. These are all the ways City of Hope scientists have revolutionized our understandment, understanding and treatment of diabetes. So with that being said, today we're joined by two, research two researchers from City of Hope. Dr. Roop, director of the WANAC Project for Type 1 Diabetes, and Dr. Debbie Thurman, deputy director of Diabetes and Metabolism Research in <clears throat> Institute. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Roop, Dr. Thurman. Also joined um, by Amy Tendrick, founder and editor of DiabetesMind.com, who has type 1 diabetes. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. And she brought her glucose tablets, just in case, too. Um, Ray Sankini Toby, JDRF Los Angeles chapter board member and type 1 parent. Thank, all, thank you all of you for being here today. Thank you. All right, so this Facebook Live event is meant to bring our diabetes community together. We have a, we have a great panel up here. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end, to and we encourage you to ask um, your, your questions in the comment section there. And if you haven't already, follow at City of Hope on Facebook and Twitter for the latest news on diabetes innovation and research. Um, so now, before we get into, into our discussion, I'm just going to ground us with some facts here. So Dr. Roop. Can you please explain what type 1 diabetes is? Okay, diabetes. Your oh. <laughs> diabetes is um, a disease where uh, your immune system um, is attacking the source of insulin. Uh, insulin is made by beta cells. They are located in small little clusters in the pancreas. They are my heroes, the hardest working cells we have because they produce a vital hormone. And for whatever reason, the immune system is actually eliminating that source. 
Um, so it's actually a disease of both the immune system and of the cells making insulin, the beta cells. Thank you. That was very concise. And <laughs> he's, a, he's a doctor. He's, you know, he's good. Um, <laughs> and now, Dr. Thurmond, um, I don't, does your mic work? Uh, we'll find out. Okay, well, it's good. Um, how is type 2 diabetes different from type 1? So type 2 diabetes is all that and more. And a bag of chips. <laughs> so um, type 2 diabetes is actually diagnosed when those insulin producing fails give up. They, they just can't control blood sugar anymore. But in the body, they don't have to control blood sugar completely by themselves. Um, there are other tissues of the body, skeletal muscle, fat, liver. They all contribute and they're all players in how blood sugar is controlled. However, type 2 diabetes comes with malfunctions in all of those tissue types. And um, so that's a key difference. The other key difference is that type 2 diabetes is considered to be highly heritable. So it's in your genes. Um, and the, of all cases of diabetes, um, about 90% of the diagnoses are type 2 diabetes. Well, um, so let me ask all of you a question. We're going to start with you, Dr. Roop. What would you say are some hot topics in the diabetes world today? Put you right on the spot there, right to start off. <laughs> well, there's actually quite a few because uh, most of what I learned in medical school turns out to be wrong. So, oh, so we've had major changes. So Debbie just said that type 2 is inherited, type 1 is not. You can inherit the risk, but, but not the disease. Uh, so that's a new thing. We also have learned that the disease is very diverse, which is uh, important because it means there will not be a magic bullet that will cure everybody, right? right? So that's important. Uh, for the patients, I think it's fantastic news that most diabetes patients still have beta cells, cells that can make insulin. They don't, they're hiding, uh, but they're there. So if we can get them back in action, that will be restoring the souls of insulin. That is very exciting. Yeah, very. And we learned that diabetes is not just an immune disease. We, I learned that it was a mistake of the immune system. It actually looks like it's a mistake of the beta cells. They're, they're stressed, they are producing too much, and that's what the immune response is acting to with, with good intentions. Uh, so that means that if you want to cure, you need to cure the problem of the immune system and make beta cells happy again. It's funny that you said it, inheritable because my uncle had type 1 diabetes and I was diagnosed and I thought he gave it to me. I haven't spoken to him since then. And uh, <laughs> so I should call him later. I'll do that on the way to the airport. Um, Amy, if I could direct that oh, same sure. question to you, what do you think? Well, so of course, um, as a patient, as patients were um, excited about research and we watched carefully what's coming out. But uh, honestly, the biggest topic in the patient community right now that I'm aware of is the insulin pricing crisis going on in this country. I hope you are all aware of how the prices have <clears throat> tripled since 2013, I believe, and people are literally dying out there because they're trying to ration their insulin. They cannot afford it. So honestly, I, that trumps everything else right now. Until we get that solved, we're, <laughs> it's hard to think beyond that. Yep. Um, at the same time, I'm very involved in um, new technologies coming out, and um, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, there's a lot of recognition that uh, just having technology that helps you get your glucose numbers and look at them in different graphs and all sorts of things is one thing, but that we also need that human touch. We also need coaching and help. That just getting uh, you know, uh, medicine and some kind of instructions and even a piece of technology is not enough. People living with diabetes struggle every day just having to like manually do things that healthy people do not. And it takes a really big toll on people's psyche. So that's a very big topic as well. Absolutely. Well said. Um, so Ray, I'd love to ask you um, that same question, but from a type one advocacy and caregiving standpoint. Uh, well, from an advocacy standpoint, insulin affordability uh, is uh, critical as well as um, getting continued federal support for type 1D research, it's, it's absolutely essential. From a caregiver standpoint, uh, this is such a burdensome and exhausting disease to manage that uh, any advancement that makes it a little bit more uh, uh, manageable, a little more effective to manage, and a little safer is big news for me and for other caregivers. Um, there have been a plethora of advances, but I think recently there's, uh, there are two that I think as, that qualify as hot topics in my book. Uh, the first is a technology that is allowing my son's 
constant glucose monitor to communicate with his pump, which is really big news and really wonderful <clears throat> in and of itself. But I think what really is significant about it is that these two devices are made by different manufacturers. And this is kind of a, a part of a bigger push we're seeing for interoperability among devices, which is really important because we want type 1 patients to have choices when they're deciding upon what devices they have to wear on their bodies 24-7 until uh, Dr. Roop gets us a cure. So, um, Big shoes. Which is soon, right? We've got, we've got a date for that yeah, coming up? No, no, I can't wait. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that's a big one, and I think a, a sign of really positive things to come. And the other thing is actually a prescription I just picked up from my son this week. It is a treatment for uh, extreme uh, low blood sugars, extreme hypoglycemia. Up to this point in time, my son and I have had to carry around this kind of kit where if he ever needs it, we need to you know, mix the solution and... <clears throat> and you know, get into a syringe and inject him, and it's a little bulky and a little difficult to use. Now we have a, um, a treatment that is deliverable in a nasal spray. Carries it this big, in his pocket, can sit on his bed stand, easy for anybody to administer to him, and I, I hope he never has to use it, but I'm sure some T1Ds will, and it is a real game changer, a huge breakthrough. I never thought I could be this thrilled about a nasal spray, but I'm um, <laughs> really excited about it. I just got the same prescription last week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My doctor was like, you know, you don't need to clear, carry around the clunky case with the syringes and the mixing it up. It's just... Tick. Yeah, it's huge. Um, Dr. Thurman, from a type 2 perspective? So two hot topics from a type 2 perspective. One, in the last 12 months, we have also, as a field, come to realize that type 2 diabetes is a very heterogeneous disease. So one person with type 2 diabetes has different symptoms, different problems, maybe even different causes of the disease than somebody else. And, and so that is a game changer because now, um, uh, some type 2 diabetics will say every day of my life is like a science experiment because they're trying to control their blood sugar, but what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. So um, knowing that you can break out into sub five subtypes um, and you can treat somebody <clears throat> faster and better and reduce the diabetes complications by doing so, that's a game changer. So that's a hot topic. The other hot topic is Pre-diabetes is now, thanks to advocacy groups, getting the word out, pre-diabetes is a thing. Most people know what it is. Challenge is they still don't know whether they have it, but the first step is now they know that it exists and that maybe they should be looking for it because if pre-diabetes is that period of the disease where it's reversible, truly reversible. So what does a cure for type 2 diabetes look like? Reverse pre-diabetes, get back to a healthy, no, no type two cure. Thank you for sharing. Um, so for the next question, Ray, you started to get into, um, you started to get into it, but I'd like you to tell us more about the unique challenges um, of a type one um, diabetic. Well, from a, caregiver from a caregiver standpoint, I think uh, what is unique about this disease is that this immediate and incredibly steep and seemingly endless learning curve that you face. When you get this diagnosis, your head is spinning, um, you're, you immediately go in for eight to nine hours of diabetes input just to teach you the absolute basics you need to get your very sick child to kind of some level of stability and, and relatively a, a healthier state. Um, and once you work your way through those very difficult and trying several months, and you're hoping you get to a plateau what you realize is that you really just made it to a vantage point from which you can see everything you don't know about this disease. And it's like 98% of everything you really should know about the disease, you just don't. So you enter this new stage of learning and research. For us, um, this was about when we started looking at um, the wonderful world of technology, and it is wonderful, and I am so grateful, but there's a ton to research a ton of choices to make. Um, once you make your choices, you get your technology. Um, if you're like me and not a tech savant, just you know, getting it functioning and figuring out how it all works together is a, is a challenge in itself. But once it's working, guess what? Instead of 
getting a blood sugar reading three or four times a day. Now you're getting it every five minutes. And uh, instead of giving one injection of long acting insulin a day, you can now change basal rates every half hour. You can change insulin to carb rates all through the day. You can do, you have so much more control. So you have this vast amount of information and this incredible control. And now you have to learn what to do with all of it. <clears throat> um, and there are ways that you can generate charts, you can analyze it, you can, but you start this next, and we're still in this stage years later of learning everything you can with all this information you've got about not just the disease, but specifically your child's disease. Because as was mentioned, it expresses itself a little differently in every patient. Um, and it's just, it's just this ongoing journey. I like to say that managing this disease starts out as a rabid sprint, and then it just transitions into this very long marathon. And along the way, you need to download your knowledge to your child so at some point they can live a healthy and independent um, life. And um, we're, we're still a work in progress, but we, we will get there. Well said, thank you for sharing. Um, and so, Amy, in your opinion, what is the, the toughest challenge to overcome as a type one diabetic right now? Well, it's funny you should ask, because one of my daughters asked me that the other day. What, what is the hardest thing? Because she sees me dealing with all sure. of this. And I said, just the, how relentless it is. So, no um, breaks. You know, to clarify, I mean, I think everyone in this room is fairly familiar, but to clarify, the reason that you're always at risk with type one is that you, if your blood sugar drops too low, you can pass out, you can have a seizure, you can die. If your blood sugar goes too high, <clears throat> over time, you will get complications, which means kidney disease, you know, blindness, all of these things. If it gets too high in just sort of an immediate sense, you can also go pass out, go into a coma and die. So. Basically, you're struggling all the time to stay in that great middle place. And everything that you do that normal healthy people do without thinking about it, like, oh, maybe I'll have a snack. Maybe I'll take the stairs instead of the elevator. Maybe I'll go for a little run. Maybe I'll sit in front of my computer for several hours instead of moving around. Everything that you do, every activity that you do impacts your blood sugar, as does sleep, stress, hormones. Like there, you know, the, there's a famous uh, article, 42 factors that affect your blood sugar. So it is so impossible to get it right all the time, but you're always struggling to just kind of hit that middle ground so that you're not having a high or a low. And it never gives you a break. You know, I go on vacation every year with my family to Europe and I have to pack multitudes of things and I always forget something critical or I'll have a low because I didn't know we were, we had, you know, I'll have dosed for my food and then we decide we're going to go on this hike. And it's like, oh no, what do I do now? You know, it's, so your life is very complicated and you never get a break from it. And I think that's the thing that people, who, you know, who aren't living with it have a, don't have a window into. Um, and that's why this is also critical and why the technology is so helpful because it takes a little bit of that burden off of us. Yeah. And a little bit off of our wallet because when you're traveling to Europe as a type 1 diabetic, I have big feet, so that's big shoes, but I also have big bottles of juice and glucose tablets and Skittles and nothing. It's like, it's an ongoing thing. So um, just to make light of it is what I mean, but it's, it's <laughs> you, as when you travel as a diabetic, you have so much more that you're caring that you're it's there, there's never a break and it's always a it's always a race and, and like amy said so eloquently everything impacts your blood sugar whether it's sitting in a computer or something as minute as taking the stairs instead of an elevator um and if your blood sugar is at 200 and you're trying to get it down you're going to take the stairs and that's something we think about on a daily basis so thank you for sharing um so dr roop um let's start with you for type one when it comes to diabetes treatment innovations and advancements, what's, what are you most thrilled about? What's, what's get you up in the morning, man? Well, what I get really thrilled about, also hearing about the burden again, is that we are actually at the start of a completely new chapter in treating diabetes, I not dealing with the symptoms. We cannot be dependent of technology with all due respect, right? Technologies can fail upon us. Sure. We actually are going to to treat the cause of the disease. And that, that really gives me goosebumps, and uh, I'm excited to go to work um, every morning. Uh, the fact that we have started to realize that patients are different, so that we can actually better learn where patients differ and then offer appropriate medication. Of course. Something to call personalized medicine. That is something that I exci I'm, I'm excited about. But also the, our new knowledge that it is also a beta cell disease gives us a completely new toolbox that where we can actually make eyelids happy again and, and, and start making insulin again. So 
I am really excited with all the prospects that have just uh, been presented to us. So am I, and I know from speaking personally, my, my islet cells are bummed. They're sad. So. Well, they, they should be because uh, they're under pressure. Right? I mean, they're not that sad, I'm just saying. Like, you know, <laughs> they're a little sad. They're halfway sad. Um, thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Thurman, let's hear what you're most excited about in type two as far as treatment, innovations, advancements. What gives you goosebumps? So, hmm, goosebumps. I'm actually going to ping off of what Bart just said. So, um, not only does it give him an opportunity to blame the beta cell, and, and, but it, it gives him an opportunity <laughs> to engage people like me and my team that we live and breathe to make islets happy again and to wake them up and say, hey, get back to work. Yeah, um, like But that. also to calm the storm that surrounds them, and that's his job. Um, so, so we actually have a great working relationship. It, it, it opens up whole new forays for researchers to work together and bring their, their relative areas of expertise, synergize, get to a cure faster. So um, that's for type one, which was not my question, but type <laughs> two, um, what I'm really excited by is the precision medicine option. You know, I, I mentioned to you previously that recently we found out that type two diabetes comes in at least five major flavors. So, but lots of us who've been working in the lab for years and years have seen human tissues malfunction in a little dish. And we have been um, trying to design drugs that can make them stop malfunctioning, make them start working again. So we've been able to do this with human tissues in the laboratory. So what I am so excited about is moving that forward. And um, it is personalized medicine because we figured out, for example, how to make islets happy again. Yeah. And so that's part of type two diabetes. My lab recently has figured out how to make skeletal muscle very happy and to stop malfunctioning and to start working positively again to repair the damage that has occurred. And so it's kind of like a menu item. I have this kind of type two diabetes, so I'm gonna need some of that and some of that and some of that. Chef talk, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's personalized. Yeah, I personalized. Yeah. I, that's, yeah, she's good. Um, all right, so next topic I'd like to talk about is technology. You know, I was diagnosed in 1990. Um, it's 2019. And uh, for me, there was, it was, you know, I remember very vividly being in the hospital with my mother and the doctor, and they were like, you know, do you know what's going on? And I was like, no clue what's going on. My mother, um, she had somewhat of an idea because her brother had had it. And, um, but the technology wasn't there. You know, for me, I like being outdoors. It's why I moved to California. So I can surf when I want to surf. I can snowboard when I want to snowboard. I can take my dog skateboarding in New York. I have to deal with seasons and all these things. But at the same time, I was always, I have to stop what I'm doing, right? To look down and check my glucose. I can't just get on a plane without knowing my glucose. I can't just go to my motorcycle and go riding through the mountains of Colorado without knowing my glucose. But with the technology and where the advances that we're at now, it's today. So I have my cell phone and my GPS and my motorcycle and I just do like just the same swipe, not like I'm checking my email when I'm driving, but I can swipe to look at my email. And the next swipe is my blood sugar. And that's pretty cool um, from 1990 until now. So, geez, got excited with that last one. Um, so with that being said, um, Amy, can you talk more about digital health and how it's playing a role in, in diabetes today? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm fortunate to have been very involved. I actually host a series of events um, that, uh, around innovation and diabetes technology for, since 2011. We just uh, last week had this forum uh, about the new closed loop systems that are coming, which is, um, as mentioned, combining the or connecting the glucose monitors with the insulin uh, delivery pumps and with a smart algorithm that basically helps to sort of automate some of that. So users still have to announce meals to say, I'm going to eat so many carbs and whatnot, and they have to be aware when they're going to exercise and sort of go back on that. But these looped systems are making a huge difference for people getting more sleep. Um, overnight, when you are not act active and you're not eating, that's a great time when the technology can kind of take over and um, really keep your blood sugar in check. So it's really exciting for the people whose lives depend on insulin. But there's also a lot more technology coming um, just to, on the sort of coaching and lifestyle side. I think that can be hugely helpful also for people with type 2 
Um, there are uh, platforms that basically allow you through a mobile app, which actually does keep records of all of your um, glucose levels, but you can also record your food and your exercise. And then they have a coaching component where through this, this technology, you can be in touch with a certified diabetes educator or another provider and ask questions and actually have someone checking up on you. So what's really great about the technology is that it's allowing, func you know, helping us with the functions of diabetes, but it's also giving us an opportunity to be more connected and to spread care. I mean, there aren't nearly enough endocrinologists or certified diabetes educators to handle all the people in this country who would need to be seen by them, but through telemedicine and through these different platforms, we're gonna be able to get the help we need um, and have it right in our pocket with our phone. So That's very exciting, yeah. So it's, it's the technology and that human component that are... And I should say, it's not only insulin pumps. The insulin pens that are out there are becoming smart pens, meaning they will also be connected, so you won't have to manually keep... No more manual tracking of data, I hope, ever. Again, <laughs> we have enough to do. So, you know, and then you will also be able to get advice on uh, making dosing decisions, um, even if you're using a pen and not necessarily a pump on your body. So there's going to be a lot of choices for people, which is great. It's very great. It's yeah. awesome. Promising. A lot of hope. Um, so... We're going to start with Dr. Thurman and then Dr. Rupp, you can bring up the tail end. But what emerging research area could have the greatest impact right now on diabetes treatment? The, I think I want to get back to those clusters. I, I've already said <clears throat> knowing how to treat an individual faster and more appropriately so that their blood sugar levels come down to where they should be will reduce diabetes complications, and, and diabetes complications have been mentioned, so um, such as uh, amputation, blindness, um, and, but there are other things that, complications that are maybe lesser known. Heart attacks, strokes. Um, Nerve damage, right? Survival, yeah. and cancer. And I know that we're gonna get to a cancer yeah. question. So I think some of the greatest um, excitement and innovations has a lot to do with being able to more directly deal with um, the type of type 2 diabetes that an individual has and um, on, a, on a per organ basis when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Some individuals might have a disease that's very much skeletal muscle centric. And I'm excited because we and others have, have devised ways to, to fix the problem with the muscle and get it operating again. The same can be said for the eyelets. And so, and there are, there are um, persons with type 2 diabetes where it is actually largely um, an insulin producing cell problem. So it's kind of like type 1 diabetes, but it's type 2 diabetes. And it's um, a global pandemic, type 2 diabetes is. Thank you for sharing. Dr. Root? The latest. Yeah, so the emerging research that could have the greatest impact on diabetes yeah. treatment right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm really getting crazy with all the, um, the new knowledge that we have about the, the dialogue between the immune system and the beta cells. And together with my friend Enrique Montero, we have a program here where we are trying to treat both the beta cells. He's here like all my other <laughs> friends in the team. Uh, to, uh, to, to actually make eyelids happy again, and, and the body can do it itself. We have, but on the other hand, we have made fantastic progress in re-educating the immune system. I actually think that people with type 1 diabetes have the best immune system in the world. Yes. That's the immune system you want to have. Yes! Really. Don't blame your immune system, blame the beta cells. <laughs> so, and I was blaming my uncle this whole time. Like. <laughs> So that basically means we should not suppress it, we sh should not bombard it into uh, remission as we do for all other inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus. No, we have to engage it, negotiate with it. And we have a fantastically new program where we simply take cells of the, the patient themselves, treat them with vitamin D for crying out loud, wow. add a vaccine, and it basically stops the mistake. It's wow. a miracle. Now, is that enough? I don't think so, because there is the beta cell that we need to tweak. And for that, we have new drugs that where we can actually deliver uh, small molecules to the pancreas, and in their backpack, they have uh, hormones that make beta, the beta cells were happy again. So we actually 
tick both boxes, and that, I think, will be the breakthrough of the future. I know I should be careful, but if you have seen what I have seen, you will be equally excited. I'm excited uh, just from hearing you speak about it. Yeah, and yeah no, the vaccine itself also, I mean, to, you can actually train the immune system not to make that mistake again. Wow. Uh, but I, at the same time, want to combine that with making beta cells happy. So that's where we're moving. Also, we were a little bit disappointed with some of the intervention studies. Uh, many of them were actually supported by the JDRF because we thought it didn't work. But when you look closely, we can actually always see small groups where these therapies work. And now that we suddenly appreciate that the disease is diverse, we need to understand it and sure. understand why it works when it works and why it fails when it fails. And then for those where it fails, find better strategies. Now, uh, that, will, that will change the game, and that will really uh, make the difference. Uh, and in the cancer, we work in a famous cancer institute. If, if we can cure 12% of the melanoma patients, everybody's excited. In the diabetes world, we think, well, we missed 88%, yeah. right? The glass is 88% empty. But I think we should really count the blessings that we really have and build on that. Yeah, I agree with you. I, there's power and hope. That's right. Um, Okay, so in everyone's own opinion, right, I would like to know what the future of diabetes looks like. It's a very heavy question. Um, and then I'd like to talk about type 1 diabetes first. Ray, uh, well, in, in your opinion, what does the future of diabetes look like? Well, I mean, I think the medical uh, technologies are continuing to improve. There are, uh, you know, we, we now refer to artificial pancreas as being available or, or on the drawing board from various companies. The thing with that technology is <clears throat> it's not like an artificial heart valve that just functions on its own and you just have to go in for checkups every once in a while. All this technology, at least everything that I know that's in the works, will require constant uh, input from the patient or the caregiver. So it's not like you can forget about your disease as um, Amy was saying, this is just, it, it, it's a constant with you all the time when you, when you exercise, when you eat, when you travel. We, we literally have a suitcase that is the diabetes suitcase. Everywhere we go, we just load it with all the stuff and that's what we take with us. Um, so I think the kind of thing that is most exciting to me and that I hope is in the future pre-cure, I mean, obviously the cure is what we really want. I keep emphasizing that to you. Um, but, um, okay, okay. Um, but I, things like a smart insulin, which is being studied now, uh, but I think there are eight or nine groups around the, the uh, world, a, a number of them supported by JD, <coughs> that are looking into uh, glucose responsive insulin. So this would be something where you could dose yourself once a day, or, you know, injection or, or perhaps something oral. <coughs> and, um, it would be uh, insulin that circulates in your body that activates when your blood sugar gets to a certain level and becomes inhibited when your blood sugar drops um, to a lower level. And uh, I mean, the, the beauty of that from a caregiver, from a mom's perspective, is my son could live a day without thinking about this disease, and that would be such a godsend. So I, I would love to see those types of treatments uh, coming available to uh, to the market, um, you know, but in this period between now and when we do have a cure. Thank you, um, Amy. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I well, I would say that if I mean that would be a dream, obviously, to have insulin that would know what to do. That would be essentially what we call a functional cure. Sure. So something that would sort of make it like you almost didn't have to have diabetes, even though you biologically still have it. The biological cure, of course, is the holy grail, but. Um, we talked a lot about game changers. I think we didn't give enough credit to continuous glucose monitors, which actually are still fairly new. They um, really have changed people's lives, changed my life. And really what I think will become, uh, the future will look like that is that that will hopefully become standard of care, meaning everyone who gets diagnosed with diabetes will immediately get on a continuous glucose monitor, no more futzing around with finger stick tests, which are uncomfortable, and only give you a tiny little bit of information, actually not much information, because you don't know the context. So the thing about the CGMs is that they're getting better. They are, there's Google's working on one that's supposedly like literally this tiny. And so they're getting smaller. Um, there's, you know, which will make them 
I think, more mainstream, you know, uh, uh, to a point where people who are even pre-diabetic might be able to take advantage of it. They'll probably be implantable. So there's a new implantable CGM on the market, which I've been wearing myself for, I don't know, six months now. Um, it's an early version that has to be, unfortunately, like um, changed out every three months. But eventually, we'll be able to wear something tiny implanted for long periods of time, which will be amazing. And then I think the other part of it is just the, um, you know, talking about standard of care, I think the prescription will be a package. And this is something we've been fighting for in my community for a long time, that when you are newly diagnosed, it, you know, of course, it's a huge learning curve, and, but you get medicine and you get instructions, but it, most people still don't get that support piece. And we've been arguing for a long time that like community should be part of the prescription, that when you come in and your diagnosis newly as a family or as an adult with, with diabetes, they're saying, you know, you need this medicine, you need to understand how to physically treat your disease, but you also need to connect with people, you need like moral support, you need like a network, you need to be able to like interact with people who understand what you're going through. And I, I think that in the future that will be part of the prescription. I think that's really powerful. Yeah. I'd like to, I mean, humans need humans, especially with something when you're dealing with this. It's and a reality check. I mean, it's a very strange thing to your life, to, especially when you're diagnosed as an adult like myself. Like, I had a, I had a whole life before this, right. <laughs> which had, you know, very different. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait, I have to do what <laughs> every time? Like, yeah, whoa, full breaks. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was not given very good instructions in the beginning to the point where I was having, like, severe lows two and three times a day and didn't, wasn't really told why that was happening. I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. I mean, just, you know, so I don't want to see anyone hit rock bottom like that and then discover the peer support community. I think we need to, to guide people there immediately. Definitely. Dr. Roop, um, so how would you answer that? The, uh, what does the future of diabetes look like? Well, I, I have a dream. I, I used to be a pessimist, right? I've become an optimist. The Love future that. of people with diabetes will not be what it used to be. Insulin is not a cure. Let's, let's face it, it's great at you know, improving your lives, but it comes with so many burdens. Um, I want people to drop their backpacks and really start making their own insulin again, and I actually think it, it can be done. I honestly believe that, uh, and it, uh, that's why we're in a, in a, in a hurry. Sure. Right? We really are so close to understanding it, and we can translate that to specific therapies not general ones that, that, of that, that completely uh, uh, ruin your immune system, but ones that actually embrace your beta cells. And that will be a game changer. I, I, honestly, I, I, I know that this sounds unbelievable to, to many, and, but I, I think that there is good reason for hope now, that we, we got it. And if you got it, you can <laughs> turn to, to a therapy. Um, I love hearing that by the you know from the, the head researcher. We got it. Like how that's a lot of hope. You know, I mean that just like filled me up. I, I don't know. It's pretty cool. Good work. Um, <laughs> okay. So for type two diabetes, Dr. Thurman, what do you think is the most? Um, the, what, what's the future of diabetes look like? So I see two aspects to the future. Persons with diabetes today, type two diabetes today. We need to get the band back together. So that is the band of all those tissues in the body that I've told you that are malfunctioning. So you can achieve that by, thank you. Like we do need the band. You can achieve that by designing drugs that restore the functionality to one of those tissues, but that also restores communication of the tissues. Part of the breakdown of type two diabetes is those tissues stop communicating with each other. And so blood glucose, sugar levels, rising in your bloodstream are the consequence of the disarray of communication. So that's I'm very excited by because people are very mindful of the fact that this communication is pivotal in curing existing type 2 diabetes. But the other thing I'm so excited by is I don't know if everyone in this room and on Facebook Live knows that the metrics are in the United States, 30 to 40 percent of Americans, adults, could be considered to be pre-diabetic and the majority of them do not know it. So what do we do for those folks? Prediabetes is their last opportunity. If you can resolve that, cure your prediabetes, you aren't gonna get type two diabetes. That's a cure. And that's what excites me and gets me to work every day. I love it.
You guys are all wonderful. And I've just even sitting up here with you, I've learned so much from each one of you. And it's, it's not only just hope, but actually like learning. You, all of you are so eloquent, so well spoken, and they're great. Um, but well, speaking of advocacy, I'd like to turn it over to the T1D Mod Squad, Rebecca and Anna, who will now transition over to questions from the audience. I know you guys have tons of questions for them. Here they come with their mics. <laughs> Catherine is a part of our T1D Mod Squad community, and I'm so uh, thankful that we're able to have some of you here that can ask these important questions that I know in our community are asked every day. So Catherine, what's your question? What do you consider a cure for type 1 diabetes? Uh, that's a very, very important question. I'm glad you asked because it, it diff <clears throat> means different things to different people. <clears throat> As an immunologist, if I can uh, get the immune system in check, that's a cure, but it doesn't produce insulin. So for an endocrinologist, it is making insulin again. Uh, for patients, it may be other things like uh, no fear for developing complications. If we can arrest progression of the disease, that could be a cure. Preventing or reversing complications, which is also something we work on very hard at City of Hope, is another way of, of of cures. So there is different levels. Now, at the same time, I uh, appreciate that we, when we launched the Wanak Family Project, we, uh, it, it got twisted to cure diabetes in six years. Well, it's a six-year project, and we want to cure it, but not in six years. We want to cure it today, sure. right? It shows our sense of urgency. So basically, what we try is at each separate level, stop the immune system to attack the islets, make beta cells happy, prevent complications. Each of this, to my mind, is a form of a cure. First things first, but don't get me wrong, I won't rest until we have people making their own insulin again, right? That's a promise, but we do it one step at a time. It's awesome. I think that's amazing and so, so encouraging, I think, for us as caregivers. Amy, will you weigh in as, as a type one yourself? Oh, of course, that. thank you. Yeah, I mean, of course, we'd love to all see it just go away and get our, you know, I remember in the beginning feeling like maybe this is just a bad dream and my body's going to go back to doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so, but now as an adult who's had it for, you know, many years, it's 16 years, um, I think I think about it more as that separate c categories of biological cure, cure versus functional cure. So biological cure would be if we can get people's, you know, bodies to be repaired and not have this condition, that would be the dream. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's really important that we focus on things that just take away the burden as much as possible. And the mention of smart insulin, I mean, that is such a pipe dream. But if you could take an insulin that uh, didn't knew what to do, it would be like having a pancreas that works again, right? So, um, you know, if I have a closed loop system that is very minimal um, intervention on my part and I can constantly keep myself in that middle range, then that's a functional cure for me. So really something that takes away, as I was talking about, that just constant thought process and struggle throughout the day. Any more questions? Hello. OK, so as you guys know, type 1 is a family disease for us, um, more than just the individual. And mental health and caregiver burnout and patient burnout is a really big problem. So what do you think can be done to provide more self-care options and education and opportunity to both the patients and the caregivers? Um, well, much more needs to be done. It's, it's a big problem. It's been identified as a problem, certainly at, at JDRF, the psychosocial <coughs> uh, component of this disease is something that just has not been addressed to the level it, it should be. Um, I, I would say that organizations like JDRF, like Beyond Type 1, offer tremendous programs, um, support, information. Um, my first experience with, um, with uh, JDRF was attending their Type 1 convention that offered, um, offered support on, on so many levels, the psychosocial uh, components of the disease, as well as you know, just technical support, what have you. I know that now my son has now just started college, which has its own uh, basket of concerns and risks. But there is now a uh, college diabetes uh, network that is um, starting at, you know, I think many, many campuses. So there's 
a support group at that level. I mean, that, that's a difficult time for, I think, all young adults, especially ones struggling with a disease like that. So that definitely has to be made part of the repertoire for uh, JDRF and all these organizations. It has to be recognized as a real problem. I think one of the statistics that concerns me uh, the most is that only about 30% of type 1 diabetics manage their uh, A1C in, a, in an acceptable target range. And I, it's not because they're ignorant. It's not because they don't have access to um, resources. I mean, some may not be just because of insulin affordability issues and others that we talked about. But I think there's a despair and exhaustion factor. Um, and we really have to fight to address that. Can, can I just say something out of, out of comfort because I, I'm, I, I hate all the, the burdens and can I just set, uh, remind people with diabetes and their families that you have the best genes in the world, at least. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, the genes, those are the genes you want to have if you have cancer. You have the best immune system in the world. That's the one you need to have to fight infections and cancer. Mm -hmm. And the yeah, fact yeah. if you manage to control your insulin, you give your remaining beta cells a break. And by doing so, you give us a little time to make them happy again <laughs> and stop the problem. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. It is important to really keep that in mind. And I completely uh, second anything that has been said. And, but, but, but believe me, we won't rest until we have achieved that promise. I think that as a caregiver of a type 1 and an administrator of one of the biggest support groups online, I think what we are trying to say is that there is a call for help when mm -hmm. it comes to the mental exhaustion of diabetes. And this, it's, there's a piece of this puzzle that's missing. Um, Amy, would you yeah, like to Yeah, I'm continue? sorry, I'm dying. Yeah. I wanted to add two things. Um, so one, the first step is recognition of the problem and the fact that we're even <clears> talking about this so much is so important. So JDRF has done one really great thing through Nicole Johnson Baker um, is they're trying to find and train more uh, mental health professionals, psychologists and whatnot to understand, to actually be able to, to work directly with people with diabetes with the specific kinds of issues that we deal with. They also created an online database where you can search someone in your area who is a, a health, mental health professional who's familiar with diabetes. We need a lot more of that. And then in San Diego, the Behavioral Diabetes Institute, which has been doing amazing work for years, but they're still so hyper-local. We need investment in programs like that where they have for parents, for grandparents, for you know, loved ones, spouses, um, just programs around how to deal with the day-to-day, because -day. it's so amazing that there's all this great research going on in the background, but we all know, like, being out there every day with it, you're not thinking about, like, hey, my beta cells might get regenerated. Like, that, that's not, you know, it's really? not top of mind. <laughs> um, you're dealing with life and so many issues. Um, so, like, there are some things that are getting built up. It's recognition, and now it's just we need to invest and grow those programs. I think it's important, and what we do that's very different, I think, than any other nonprofit in T1D Mod Squad is we walk 24 hours a day, seven days a week with our parents. There is somebody online mm. at all times to help another parent. Parent to parent support, peer to peer support, children to children support. And that is absolutely something that is vital. Yeah. I really believe vitally important. Totally. Well, I think I know the next question I'm excited to ask, and it's for you, Sam. Oh, wonderful. I'm um, kind of excited about what do you do with the cooking aspect? How do you integrate that into your day-to-day -day lifestyle with TUND? Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, I was lucky. I, was, I found out what I wanted to do, what I was, like, naturally my calling at a young age, and it was around the same time I was diagnosed. So I was diagnosed at age 12, but I was already messing around in the kitchen and making Thanksgiving by the time I was 14. So I had this love affair with food, but at the same time I was dealing with like highs and lows and not knowing, you know, as a young boy, right? Um, so when you grow into your profession and you, you, you get a little wiser with what you do, it's been kind of my, um, my passion in food to make, you know, we all have food that we can relate to, whether it was that we, had it traveling to a different country, or it was a Sunday night supper with our family, or something that my grandmother used to make. Um, I'm from the South. Not all the food that you eat in the South is necessarily something that's really good for you. Um, so it's kind of been 
like a passion of mine to recreate all those foods that we know, that we love, the comfort food that when we were a child that brings us to the table, that brings us to our grandparents' house in our mind, or brings us to that trip to Mexico or wherever it was that we had. But take that knowledge and that love of that, um, that original dish and then tweak it, make it more modern, make it more healthy with the, with the things that are available to us, right? Because we don't have to use white sugar in our food. It's a toxin. Why use it, right? right? But we can use honey, but we can use maple syrup, but we can use apple puree. We don't have to use white flour in our food. We don't need it. We can use almond flour, we can use coconut flour, we can use chickpea flour, we can use artichoke flour. I can do this for days. So tweaking so, it. Mm -hmm. Tweaking it, making it more modern for our body. You know, I just don't think that um, the way that some of the food, that some of the comforting food, it's comforting because of the memory. Sure. But we can still get that same flavor and that same excitement in a more modern way with a really cool chef cooking it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, we have an online question. Um, how can we as a community become part of and or fund, ongo fund ongoing studies and research? Dr. Roop, would you like to answer that one? Well, we need all the support <clears throat> we can get. Um, I have been supported by JDF for 30 years. I started when I was 12, by the way. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, at Me this time, JDF is supporting us as an advocacy, advocacy group mm -hmm. to negotiate with the FDA to get things in the clinic quicker, get it in children quicker, faster. Uh, so that is something that I am um, uh, grateful for, that type of support. If you want to support our mission, go to the website, City of Hope, look at the Wanak Family Project. We, we, we'd love to have you join our mission mm -hmm. to cure type 1 diabetes. And uh, uh, there is always something uh, new to be discovered. So uh, join us. Well, you, you know, we're one, of your, yeah, we're one of your biggest supporters, Dr. Roop, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll, it's time for closing. Okay. Sam? All right, so what I'd love to do is just do a quick little recap um, and talk about, I mean, this has been awesome. All of you guys are just rock stars and all of, just legitimately, but you're better than rock stars. They just sing. You guys are doing so much more than that. Um, so. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sh I can't say that. Our Nick Tell Jonas my is my partner. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Nick. I didn't even, these guys are, you're, everybody's equal. Um, so. Our diabetes community, as you can tell, it's so unique, it's so, um, and we're passionate. And you know, for me, like some of the highlights from this thing, I just, it's really cool that for 30 some odd years, I've been living with um, sad beta cells and these guys are gonna make them happy again. That's something for me that like just really perked me up. You know, when researchers and doctors and moms and advocates and people living with type one are stoked and they get goosebumps, I get goosebumps because I'm not on the front lines of them. I'm doing my advocacy things. I'm talking about it. I'm letting people know that, hey, I'm a face in this world, but I don't have the answers. These folk right here, they're just, they give me a lot of hope and it's really cool to sit up here with them. And you two give me a lot of hope as well. Um, the research and the technology is offering a lot of hope. It's true. Like a guy like me, you know, I'm wearing a CGM. It's changed my life. Um, and like you said, I would love to see that everybody has, able, has access to a CGM. It's just, it's up-to-date glucose information that's telling you where it came from, the context, whether it's predicted to go up or low. I didn't have that type of information. You didn't have that type of information 13 years ago. You definitely didn't have it 30 years ago. Um, and so, you know, it's just a cool time. Uh, preci precision medicine, that's something that is new to me too. I think that's very, you know, because I think prior to this conversation, I was just thinking that like diabetes is, it's a general, you know, you're a diabetic, so you have to do this and you do this and it's for all of us. It's gonna work for me, it's gonna work for you. Not the case, precision, that's a key. It's, it's personalized medicine and I think that's really, um, it's a beautiful thing. And um, this information, the dialogue that we had today, it's essential. That's kind of what I'm getting at. I've, I've learned so much and I've been living with this disease um, for two thirds of my life, right? Um, so when you can take someone up here who's in their 40s and been living it since they're prepubescent and I can take away from this, mu take away this much, it's a good darn day. Um, right, Eva? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna leave you with this closing statement. To learn more about the extraordinary work that these folks are up to here at the City of Hope, um, I would love for you to join the Quest for a Cure at thecityofhope.org and join us right back here at Facebook tonight at 5 p.m. 5 p. Pacific um, Standard Time as the City of Hope shines a light on diabetes awareness by lighting the campus blue and you can tell we got the memo. We're blue. Okay, we're all blue. There's everybody's blue. You don't have to. You already do enough. You don't have to dress in blue. Um, thank you for joining. It's been awesome. I hope we should do this again. Have a great day. <laughs>